Hello wonderful person, this is Anton, and today we're returning to Venus once again. Now interestingly, this indescript planet you're looking at, that's essentially Venus. This is what Venus looks like in a telescope. Although in reality, because it reflects about 90% of light, it's actually a little bit brighter even. Hello wonderful person, today we're talking about another discovery coming from this beautiful planet, and another discovery that once again suggests something unusual, possibly life-oriented, is happening in the atmosphere of this unusual, somewhat deadly, but also somewhat mysterious planet. So, it looks like we've discovered an amino acid, an amino acid known as glycine that, surprisingly, is very prominent in pretty much every type of life here on the planet. As a matter of fact, you and I right now contain a lot of this glycine in our bodies. One of the most common proteins in our bodies is this right here, this is called collagen. The protein responsible for a lot of different activity in our bodies and something that's essential for our skin, for example. And around 30% of our body is made out of collagen. At the same time, about 30% of this protein is made out of glycine, which also suggests that about 10% of our bodies is made out of this um, amino acid. And even though there are roughly around 5 to 600 amino acids we already know exist in nature, only about 20 amino acids are used by life, including of course us, and this is one of them. So naturally discovering something like this in an atmosphere of another planet is of course extremely exciting. But here we have to be very very careful, because first of all glycine has already been discovered in for example asteroids and comets. As a matter of fact, this comet right here, 81P Wild, is one of the comets where glycine was streaming out at all times. So we do know that glycine exists in space, we also know that it exists in uh, different types of rocks and different types of ices orbiting in space, but we've never really found it on another planet. Like for example, there doesn't seem to be glycine on Mars, at least as of now, and there doesn't seem to be glycine present in either the atmosphere of Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, or uh, Neptune. And obviously Mercury doesn't have any glycine either. So discovering this amino acid that's present in all of the or most of the life on Earth and also finding it in the atmosphere of the nearest planet to us where we've already discovered signs of potential life is of course a telltale sign of something strange happening here. Now since the original discovery of phosphine in the atmosphere of Venus, there have been a lot of follow-up papers and most of these papers so far are trying to investigate the reality of the discovery, but also are trying to find if phosphine could be produced in some other inorganic ways. One of the recent papers, for example, investigated the idea of volcanic reactions and various types of volcanic eruptions on the surface of Venus, trying to find a potential chemical way where phosphine could be generated naturally. And this is actually related to a lot of the comments I've been getting from you wonderful people, especially those of you familiar with chemistry in general, who did point out that, well, there are actually chemical ways for phosphine generation by essentially turning the phosphides, which could be produced by volcanoes, into a type of a phosphoric acid first, and then having that acid disintegrate into phosphine under high temperatures. However, as of right now, the scientists behind the original phosphine discovery still suggest that such reactions would not really be probable in the atmosphere. Personally, I definitely have to do a little bit more chemical research here to discover what exactly it is that's stopping these reactions from happening naturally. For now, we're just going to leave it at that because there are going to be more follow-up papers with more actual chemical investigations of what can and can't happen in the Venusian atmosphere. We're still not entirely clear on how much phosphorus acid there is in the atmosphere. And so while the scientists are figuring out if phosphine could be produced by volcanoes that essentially react with water in the atmosphere and turn phosphorus acid into phosphine, let's really talk about what the scientists discovered now. So glycine, as I mentioned, is a ubiquitous amino acid. It's also the simplest amino acid we have. But despite its simplicity, it is absolutely essential for the proper functioning of many different proteins, and it's the reason why certain proteins are able to create these structures right here, known as alpha helices. In other words, despite its simplicity, it is fundamental to the creation and the complexity of life on our planet. It also seems to have other specific needs for humans as well, like for example, it seems to act as a neurotransmitter and thus play an important role in the neuron activity in our brains and of course other parts of our bodies. But even though it's everywhere and also is extremely important for life, it's not really a biosignature. In other words, it's not necessarily a sign that life is actually happening in that particular location, in this case, the atmosphere of Venus. 
So even though we've discovered glycine in the atmosphere, and even though we've possibly even found phosphine here, this does not necessarily mean that life was discovered for sure. These are still just independent signs that possibly suggest life, but none of this individually shows us any proof. Nevertheless, there are still some very interesting correlations in their discovery in comparison to the discovery of phosphine. For example, just like phosphine, it was also located in a relatively similar part of the atmosphere, and both the phosphine and the glycine were also mostly found along the equator, not so much, actually not at all, at the poles. In other words, the correlation in the amount of glycine and phosphine was actually quite high in terms of the presence in the same regions. And although here on Earth glycine and phosphine could be potentially signs of life as well, in this case, the natural explanation is still possible. Like for example, the reason why it could only be present in the equatorial and not the polar regions, as also mentioned by the authors of this paper, is in regards to how atmosphere circulates on our own planet as well. The so-called Hadley cells that you see right here generally push the atmosphere toward the same region and normally toward the equator. So in this region here, you'd actually find a lot more different types of mixing and different types of activity, as opposed to in the polar regions where the actual mixing is much lower. So the combination of the slow rotation of Venus with unusually fast winds on Venus could theoretically create Hadley cells that would just push all of the materials toward the equator, and all of the chemicals released by the volcanoes would just end up in the equator, as opposed to ending up in the polar regions. Yet at the same time, the Hadley cells on Venus would most likely take around 70 to 90 days to circulate the materials here, and this would technically be more than enough for a typical bacterial life to go through all of its cycles of replication and even evolution, and to then spread to other parts of Venusian atmosphere. And the other really unusual correlation is actually in the shape of this graph that you see right here. This shows you the distribution of, as you can see, glycine and phosphine. And the distribution of both of these materials seems to match in terms of the shape of altitude versus the mixing ratio. In other words, what this graph tells us is that they do seem to correlate with one another quite directly. In other words, whatever is producing phosphine could possibly be exactly the same way that the glycine is produced as well. Now, that is actually what makes this extremely interesting, because on the one hand, this is a direct suggestion that this could be life-related. But on the other hand, we could have also discovered some unusual chemical reaction that we've never even thought of before, a reaction that could also be volcanic in origin, that first of all could possibly have nothing to do with life, but second of all would definitely help us understand how these materials are produced in other conditions. And for all we know, we could maybe find a way to use this to produce certain materials here on planet Earth as well. But just a quick reminder, we can't really rush and say that this is a life for sure. Just like with the discovery of unusual formations inside this asteroid right here, where something that resembled life was discovered in the asteroid, I think about two decades ago now, back in 1996, and was also an official announcement of the discovery of life on Mars, this turned out to be not really true. This was a chemical reaction producing these, and we were able to successfully recreate them here on Earth as well. We also know that the famous Miller-Urey experiment was able to kind of recreate these initial conditions on planet Earth by combining all of these chemicals with electrical discharge, and was also able to produce a lot of these initial amino acids, including glycine, or actually a precursor to glycine. So in that sense, this is chemically possible without any life whatsoever. So unless we really send a mission here and get a sample of the atmosphere and try to see if there's anything inside, we're probably not going to know for sure if it's life. But there's still important stuff to learn from these discoveries. And one major discovery that the researchers mention in the paper is that, well, it's possible that Venus is actually undergoing its initial stages of biological evolution. In other words, it's quite possible that this is exactly what Earth was like billions of years ago when the life just started to evolve. And if so, we might actually use Venus as a kind of a very interesting biological experiment to see how life evolves on other planets and to then start looking for similar signs somewhere else out there on other exoplanets. But no matter how you look at it, we kind of are still left with the same conclusion. We have no idea what's going on here, and the only way we can find out what's happening is by sending more missions, more investigations, and also conducting more very specific observations of the atmosphere of this beautiful planet. Because for all we know, these are just our biases. 
For all we know, there is no phosphine or phosphine possibly is produced by volcanoes and for all we know, it's not really glycine we just saw. But maybe for example, sulfur oxide, which does seem to have very similar spectroscopic features. So in that sense, maybe these are just our biases and our desire to discover life somewhere out there and we're desperately trying to find every sign of it somewhere near us. So until we actually go here and until we actually find a way to collect the atmosphere and the samples from Venus and possibly even analyze them or return them back to Earth, we're not really going to know for sure what's happening in the atmosphere and on the surface of this beautiful planet. But until more investigations and more interesting discoveries, that's all I wanted to mention in this video. Discovering glycine here is still very exciting, but still not a definitive sign of alien life. On that note, once we discover more, I'll follow this up with another video, so make sure to subscribe, share this with someone who loves learning about space and sciences, maybe come back tomorrow to learn something else, and maybe support this channel on Patreon, or by buying the wonderful person t-shirt you can find in the description. I'll see you tomorrow, space out, and as always, bye bye.